continuing our sermon series today called The Devil's Playbook. Uh, this is part two of a message we started last week, and we're looking at, at key plays from Satan's playbook. He has a bunch of plays in his playbook, but we're looking at some of the ones that he loves and that he runs over and over and over. And we're doing that because if we know what play he's going to run, we can formulate a defense against that. And so last week we saw the, the oldest play in the book. He drew it up in the Garden of, of uh, Eden, and it was deception. It's a play that he still loves to use. It works very, very well. And we all saw that this play has, has three variations or parts. He questions God's word. He denies God's word. And then he substitutes something of his own in place of God's word. His goal is, is that we're either going to add to or we're going to change or we're going to take away from God's word. That's his goal for us when he runs this deception play. And he uses it very subtly. We saw that in the Garden of Eden. What Satan's goal is to keep us from God. He knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is losing this war. He knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the end God will prevail because he knows God's word better than any of us. But his goal is, since he can't destroy God, his goal is to hurt God in any way that he can, and his way to hurt God is through you and through me. He touches the people that God loves. And that's what we're, we see when he runs this play. And, and he runs it all the time today. Look at, look at the theory of evolution. That is a lie. That is a deception that is created by the enemy. It's not an old theory. It's a relatively new theory. But if you look at that theory, what it does is it puts man at the center of the universe and not God. And that's what Satan is looking for. He's looking to replace God with himself. He wants you to push God out and to allow him, or maybe not even him, but, but the things he stands for in. And he does it very subtly. You, you think about abortion. You think about the lie that's there. They'll say, it's, this isn't about babies. This isn't about, it's about women's rights. No, it's about a baby inside of a womb that is terminated. And so there's subtle lies that, that come into place. And, and he does this all the time. But the good news is there's a counter for this play. And it works every single time. It's guaranteed to work. It's called the Word of God. It's the Bible. It's, it's the inspired, infallible Word of God. And that can defeat Satan's lies. And so we're going to look at that today. The, the thing is, you can't reason with Satan. If you do, you're going to be defeated. Because his reasoning has advanced pretty well over all of time. And he can reason better than anybody here on the earth. So you may try to reason with him. He's going to defeat you. Man's wisdom is no match for Satan's lies. But the Word of God is. And that is our only defense against this play. Anything other than that allows the enemy to just trample over us and run us into the dirt. This week we're going to go back. We're going we're to look at some more film. You know, don't you wish we actually had film? Our film's the Word of God. But it'd be pretty cool to see these things actually play out. You almost wish they invented security cameras, you know, 5,000 years prior to when they did. But we're going to look at this. We're going to see how, how someone successfully overcame the deception of the enemy, and that someone's named Jesus. So we're going to be in Matthew 4 today. All three of the synoptic gospels, you say, what are the synoptic gospels? It's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are called the synoptic gospels. And all three of them record 
this event. And we're going to look at it from Matthew's perspective in Matthew 4. So Matthew 4.1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Did you catch that? Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Isn't it amazing how we always think the Holy Spirit is going to take us to the best place in the world, but sometimes the Holy Spirit needs to take us to a place of desolation and isolation so that we can get closer to God and defeat the enemy? Sometimes He leads us into places we don't want to go. We think, you know, oh, the Spirit, He'll always take me right where I want to go. No, sometimes He'll take you where you need to go, but sometimes the easiest route is not from here back to that bathroom. Sometimes the route he wants to take me is up and down every pew or something. He'll take me where I need to go, but he sometimes leads me in a way that I don't want to be led. And that's what he's doing here. Matthew is, is emphasizing here that the Spirit is the one that led Jesus into the wilderness. And nobody likes to be led into the wilderness, but sometimes it's necessary to advance our walk, to advance our ministry, to advance whatever it is that we're going through in life. And here's a spoiler alert. Jesus makes it through this. The Spirit will never lead you to a place that God can't deliver you from. Second verse says, And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You ever notice the, the enemy likes to attack us when we're at our weakest? He hadn't had any food in 40 days. He's weak physically. He's weak mentally. He's, he's weak everywhere. He's exhausted. And, and it, Matthew, this has got to be the biggest understatement in the Bible. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No, I don't think he was probably hungry. Hungry is, you know, I didn't eat breakfast this morning, but I ate last night. I'm a little hungry. Jesus was famished. Jesus was starving. My kids will say that, you know, when they come home from school, I'm starving. I'm like, you're not starving. I mean, you, you ate at school, you ate breakfast, you're not starving. If, if we don't give you a snack, you're not going to die by supper time. And, and Jesus is, he, he's in bad shape here. He's been 40 days without food. That says hungry, but I imagine it could also say hangry. Anybody ever been hangry? You're, you're so hungry, you're angry. Yeah, Jed has, I am all the time. Uh, I, I am constant when I'm counting calories, especially I get hangry. Anybody ever, ever been in a situation like this? This, you know, hopefully you haven't went 40 days and 40 nights without food, but you're hungry. And outside of the cross, this might be the weakest moment in Jesus's earthly life. 40 days and nights without food. When Jesus is at his weakest, here comes the enemy ready to pounce. He did that with Jesus, he'll do it with you. Verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. We see the same thing that we saw back in the Garden of Eden last week in Genesis 1. He says, If you are the Son of God. If you are. What's He doing? He's questioning the words of God the Father. He's questioning God's words. We see it in Matthew 3, right before this. If, if your Bible's on the same page, look at that. If not, turn it back one page. But in Matthew 3, Jesus goes to John to be baptized. And when Jesus is baptized, this really awesome thing happens. And Matthew describes it in Matthew 3.16. It says, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, 
And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Right before the temptation, God spoke on this issue. God said, This is my Son. The word is definite. There's no, there's no question here. This is. Not this might be. Not, not, you know, if he does what he's supposed to, I'll claim him. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And then Satan comes in and he did just like we saw last week. He begins to question God's word. He begins to question Jesus' identities, what he's really doing. He's saying, if you are the son of God, he's questioning him. He runs the same play against Jesus that he did against Eve. But it's a much different result this time. Look at verse 4. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's what I want you to notice. Jesus is 100% human, 100% God. He didn't use divine power. He didn't banish Satan to hell. He didn't call down a legion of angels. What he did is the same thing that's available to you and me today. God's word. And he used God's word and he spit it back into the enemy's face. And he responded with truth. Jesus quoted from the Word of God, the Bible, we know He was filled with the Spirit. The dove descended down. We know He was filled with the Word of God. And He uses that against Satan. Paul calls the Bible the sword of the Spirit. And so that's His weapon that He's using here. And it's our primary weapon when Satan runs this play of deception against us. Our primary defense is the Word of God. So just like we studied last week, Satan's offense, let's look at Jesus' defense this week. First thing you need to know to do is you've got to memorize God's word. Look at verse 4 again. But Jesus got out his iPhone and read from his Bible app, Man shall not live by bread alone. No, no, that's not what it says. Jesus got his Strong's Concordance out, quickly looked up bread, and turned to the Bible passage that mentioned bread the best. Now, it says, Jesus answered, it is written. Satan spoke, Jesus processed it, and immediately out of Jesus' lips came the word of God. We think memory verses are just for kids. We think memory verses are, are just something that, you know, kids earn incentives for. I used to get incentives. I, I got stuffed animals when I was little. I got cash when I was older. I knew my memory verse every single week because I knew that it put money in my pocket. That's not all memory verses are about, though. You and I need memory verses, maybe more than these kids need memory verses. You and I are being attacked by the enemy. We're being, we're being inundated with propaganda from the enemy every single day. We need to have the Word of God in our mind and in our heart so that we can spew it right back at Satan. We need to know Scripture. We ought to be memorizing it. You say, I don't know if I can do that. You can, I promise you. Start with Jesus wept. Everybody remember that? Two words. You'll remember it next week. You just memorized the scripture. Find an app. There are apps on your phone to help you with Bible memorization. You say, well, they're free. Uh, the free ones aren't very good. I don't want to pay for one. It'll be the best investment you ever made if you pay for it. And those apps are not expensive. It's not going to cost you $200 or something, probably five bucks. 
Pay for one. It's worth it. It's an investment. If you memorize the word of God, you can speak when Satan is trying to deceive you. You can process the lies that the enemy tries to sell. And you can spew it back immediately. We've got to learn the word of God. Come up with some way, whatever works best for you. Uh, I, I'll tell you a great way is get a post-it note. Put it on your mirror, whatever scripture you want to read, whatever scripture you want to memorize. And every morning and every evening, and if you're at home during the day, hopefully it's three times a day after every meal, when you brush your teeth, or guys, when you shave, study that verse. When you've got it down, pull the post-it note off, stick a new one up there. Or leave them up there and test yourself on them. Because over time, they slip away. Memorize the scripture. It, it doesn't take a lot of time. You can do it while you brush your teeth. You're supposed to brush for like a minute, right? It doesn't take long, though. Just come up with a way to do it. You say, why do I do that? Here's what the psalmist said in Psalm 119.11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 3730 says, The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. And Psalm 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. When we've got it in our heart, when we memorized it, when we've got it in our minds and in our hearts, it's easier to defend against this deceptive play. Look at verse 5. Satan comes back again. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Why do we need to memorize the word of God? Because Satan knows the word of God. And he knows it better than you. He's been studying it for a lot longer. He's been memorizing it for a lot longer. And he'll use it and he'll twist it. And it'll be very subtle. And you won't know the difference unless you know the word of God. He's had thousands of years of practice at deceiving you. He knows this play well enough, he can twist it. So what he's using here is he's using a scripture. It's Psalm 91, verses 11 to 12. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to put them side by side, just like we did last week. You can look at Satan's words versus God's word. Matthew 4, 6, he says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written... He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now look at Psalm 91, 11 to 12. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. He leaves that part out. Everybody see that? On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. He leaves some words out, so he's very subtly twisting it. But more importantly, what he's doing is he's completely pulling it out of context. People do that. Look at Psalm 91.9. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. Then it says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Satan denies God's word by ripping it out of context and putting his own spin on it here. That's what he's doing. It's, it's all contingent. Psalm 91 is all contingent on making the Lord your dwelling place and living in the center of God's will. That's what it's all about. He's taking that out and he's saying, just, just do your own will. Just throw yourself down. If we go our own way, God's not always going to protect us. If I go out to the, to the Tallahatchie Bridge, 
Some of you have heard of that famous song. And I jump off. Is God going to protect me from that? Probably not. I don't know how high the Tallahatchie Bridge, but Billy Joe McAllister, it didn't work out well for him. God's not going to protect us when we go our own way. He's not obligated to. We take matters into our own hands. And, and so when you look at that passage in context, if we're in the center of God's will, He's going to protect us. Doesn't mean we're going to live forever. Nobody is, unless the rapture comes. Doesn't mean we're not going to go through things. We're going to go through things. Jesus warns us of that. But if I'm doing my will and not his, there's no obligation to protect me in that. Satan takes this passage and, and he's denying God's word just like he did in the garden. This time he's ripping it out of context. And it's the same thing people do today. Judge not, lest you not be judged. You can't judge me. You're ripping a verse out of context. We studied that when we went through the Sermon on the Mount. Go back, listen to that sermon about what it really means. God wants to heal everybody. All you've got to do is ask and He'll do it. That's ripped right out of context with everything else in Scripture. Or even the big one, John 3.16, you know, whoever believes in me shall not perish but have eternal life. All I got to do is believe in him then, right? Don't have to follow him. All I got to do is believe in him. That's not what the rest of Scripture says. You've got to interpret Scripture by Scripture altogether. Even the demons believe. You think you're going to have a demon for a neighbor in heaven? You've got to interpret Scripture in context, and there's more to it than that. And so you've got you to read it in context. And, and Christians are some of the worst because we know the Scriptures at ripping them out of context and using them in an improper way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're ripping that out of context. You believe that? You think it works? Would y'all do me a favor? Anybody that believes that? Would you fly up to the top of the steeple and straighten it? Because the birds sit on it and it's crooked and it bothers me, but we have no way to get up there. So if you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, would you please do that? Or you could read it in context. And you could see that Paul says, I can make it through anything because God is right there with me as I'm going through all of these things. We see these passages all the time ripped out of context. We see their meanings changed. And that is all serving Satan's purpose. He's denying God's word. When you rip it out, when we say everybody is healed, God wants to heal everybody. Listen, you're going to get healed someday. You're going to get healed in heaven. God's going to do it miraculously. Sometimes He uses doctors. Sometimes it just takes some time to get over an illness. Those are the four ways you're healed. But we've, we've come to a point in our society where we say, okay, you come up, you're going to be healed, I'm going to lay hands on you. That's just not biblical. It's not it's ripping passages right out of context. Sometimes God needs us to go through something so that we can minister to others later. It just, that is the way that the word, when you look at it all in context, is you say, so what difference does that make? Because if I come up here and I need a healing and God doesn't heal me right then and the pastor says, God wants to heal everybody, what do we do? Well, what's wrong with me? And what we do is we say, you don't have enough faith. That's the problem. You don't have enough faith. How much faith does it say it takes? Faith, the grain of a mustard seed. That's not very much faith. You remember the guy who was the demoniac's dad? He comes down, the disciples couldn't heal the guy. Jesus comes right down. He says, I can heal him if you believe. He says what? I believe, help my unbelief. 
and he heals him. It's not faith. What's the problem then? We, we rip those things out of Scripture, and that's what people say. Well, God didn't heal me. What do I need him for? The preacher said, everybody's healed. I'm not, why do I need God? That's ripped out of context, and that's what it's doing in our society today. We see people straying from Christ because we're ripping passages out of context. That's a variation of Satan's play. It is. I'm not saying people can't have disagreements theologically. I'm saying people are ripping these things out and using them for purposes other than advancing God. Look what Jesus does in verse 7. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He gives us here the second defense. Your second defense is you need to use God's word properly. Use it properly. Jesus not only memorized God's word, but he used it properly. He considered the whole context of the Bible in this instance. He's comparing scripture with scripture. He's not just cherry picking a scripture that, that's taken and ripped out of context. He's He's taking into consideration the whole Word of God. Listen, nobody's saying you may not get healed. I believe God heals people. I believe God can intervene in any instance, in any situation, at any time. I believe that when we lay hands on you and pray for you, I believe God's going to heal you. If He doesn't, that's him. That's the context. What did Jesus say? In this world, you will have what? Trouble, trials, turmoil. That's the amplified version probably. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You've got to consider it all in context. You've got to use it properly. And when you do that... You're going to defeat Satan's false claims. He loves to take things out of context. And we all have to have a grasp on Scripture. We all have to understand it. And, and we'll, we'll, I'll give you a couple of more points here in just a minute as to how to do that. But Jesus again, or Satan again, uses the same thing that he does in the garden. This deception play doesn't change. It's the same today. Look what he does in verse 8. Now he takes it to the third way. The third way is what? He tries to substitute his lie for God's lie. Look at verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt serve the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Verse 11 says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. He uses his third variation, just like he did in the garden. He comes in, he substitutes his own life. He says, Here's what I'll do, Jesus. I'll... I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. All you've got to do is just bow down and worship me. That's it. That's, that's not much. Everybody else is doing it. I mean, look around. Everybody's doing this. It's okay. He's trying to give him wealth. He's trying to give him power. He's trying to give him earthly persuasion. Everything that we seek after he says, all you've got to do is bow down and worship me. You can have it all. <clears throat> Jesus knows Satan's substituting a lie. He knows the reason he came to this earth was to build his kingdom. 
And his kingdom's not of this world. His kingdom is a spiritual world. That's what he told Pilate. It's established in the hearts of his people. When we accept him, when we surrender to him, the kingdom of heaven is there. When we resist conforming to the world because our minds are transformed, that's the kingdom of heaven at work. And so Satan is trying to prevent Jesus from fulfilling God's plan. Aren't you glad he failed here? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't say, you know, sure, man, I will bow down and worship you. We would not have a way of salvation today. We wouldn't have a way of salvation. Jesus knew the truth. He knew God's plan was that he come to this earth He live a spotless, perfect life. He give his life as a ransom for you and for me. And he knows that. And so he's not buying in to this substituted lie. His goal was the cross. His goal was the empty tomb. And he knew that. And he knew there were no shortcuts to get there. We promise people and to society today there are many ways to heaven. I saw an article this week where the, the uh, Pope Francis, the Catholic Pope, said uh, there are many ways to get to heaven. That's a lie from the enemy. That is substituting the enemy's plan for God's word. He defeated the deception play because he memorized, he used the word of God. Here's what you got to do. You got to study God's Word. There's no way to get around it. You got to study God. You got to do more than read it. You got to do more than memorize it. You got to study it. Sunday morning coming to church is not studying God's Word. This is why we got in a problem in 2020. This is why we we saw a whole lot of people leave the church this is why those people haven't come back to the church you know why because they're coming here they're relying on the pastor to spoon feed them feed me pastor i'm ready just just put it on in my mouth would you could could you could you swallow for me could you do this and help me to swallow too because that's i just don't even want to do that we saw those people and then what happens We're shut down. We were down for, what, eight weeks? We went online. Nobody watched it. Some of you watched it. Not many people watched it. People were without the Word of God for eight weeks. Why? Because they don't have a regimen and a routine other than the pastor feeding it. You take the pastor out of the situation. It's not just this church. It's churches all across the world that... that, They lost people during that time. You cannot just rely on me to give you the word. Listen, we live in a time, I do not know how how guys like like Pastor Ron and Pastor Dave and and Fred Franks, my pastor growing up, and and Barbara's husband who was a pastor, and, 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 you know, Pastor Pig and early in his ministry, I don't know how these guys did it. Because they don't have the world wide web at their fingertips through. I can access anything. I can access all kinds of study Bibles. I can access all kinds of commentaries. It's just, it's free. It doesn't cost me a dime. You all have access to that too. You got to be careful. Don't get on Joe Bob's webpage. If it's from. You know, I was looking last night, I, I googled something, I was like, oh, that looks like a good article. Then I look up at the top, and it doesn't say Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints anymore. They made it a little bit different so that you think it might be, but I know what it is in reality. I'm like, okay, I'm not reading that. That's, no, that's, that's not what I want to read. That's not where I need to get my theology from. You've got to know those things, but you have it all at your fingertips. You have it all on your phone. It's all right there. If we don't study the Word of God, it's just laziness on our part. It really is. 
No other society has had this much access to the word of God. In, in my office, I have a whole shelf, like, like a, a shelf, and I think it goes up to a second, just of Bibles, different translations, different commentaries. I have it sitting, right? Jesus didn't even have a Bible. <laughs> None of the apostles did. It was all right here. We are in a society where we have access to some, we, there's no excuse to not study God's word. You say, I don't have the time. I can't find the time. Don't find it and make it. You have to make time. You can't just find it. You'll never find it if you're looking for it. Make time. But think about it. Would, would you want a mechanic working on your car who said, you say, have you had any training? Well, I go once a week and listen to a guy for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, if he's really going, sometimes an hour. But uh, I listen to him once a week. Uh, yeah, I can work on your car. Or how about this? Would you want a heart surgeon working on your heart who says, uh, yeah, I go, I go listen once a week for an hour. Now, I, you're not operating on me. I want you to have an education, have a, have a background in what you're doing. I want you to have continuing education so that you're not cutting me, you know, open and, you know, bleeding me out and stuff like they used to do. I, I want to know what's going on. If you don't, Satan's going to take you away. If you don't study it, he's going to take you and deceive you. And he's going to do it through TikTok. He's going to do it through YouTube prophecies. He's going to do it through Facebook posts. He's going to do it through TV preachers. He's going to do it some way or another. Fourth thing, we got to think about God's word. How do you read your Bible? Where's my Bible reading? I didn't read yesterday. I was too busy with SHP. 18 beds yesterday, praise God. Here's my Bible reading schedule. It's got a nice little checklist right there. Do you just read it and get through and, okay, I'm going to read through it as fast as I can and then I'm going to check it off. Is that how you do it? That's not the right way. You got to read it and think about it. You ought to pray about it as you're reading it. God, show me what's in here. God, I don't just want to read for knowledge. God, I want to read to retain. I want to read to get it in my heart. You got to let God speak to you through his word. It's not just a book. It's not a novel. It's not, it's not something to entertain. God speaks through his word most of the time. When God's speaking to you, that is the number one way he speaks, through the word. He can speak through other ways, but this is the number one way. He'll speak to you through his word. You've got to give him time. The word is meditate. We don't like that word because we think, you know, oh, that's not, it means just think about it. Let, it. let it process a little bit. Look at this scripture, Joshua 1.8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Not just to get it done, day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to, to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Psalm 1, 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And then you've got to develop a love for the word of God like we see the psalmist in 119. You ever read Psalm 119? Longest in the Bible. It's like, I see that on my checklist and I'm like, why did they not take three days for psalm 119 why is it one day i mean and i'm and i'm reading others on top of it listen to just a few highlights psalm 119 verse 14 in the way of your testimonies i delight as much as in all riches psalm 119 72 the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now keep in mind, honey was their Snickers bar. Sweeter than that, 
Psalm 119, 127 to 128. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. And then 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words, my eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. Did you catch his love? He would rather have God's word than silver, than gold, than, than sleep, than food, than money. All those things he mentions. And that's a very long passage. You can read more in there. It's a very wonderful passage. Early in the morning, late at night, he said, it's not just my five minutes, my, my 30 minutes I allot. I'm always thinking about your word, he says. That's the kind of follower of Christ who's able to use God's word against this deception. Do you have a love for God's word like that? Then the last thing, we have to rely on the Holy Spirit. You have to. You can't just rely on a pastor how many times have I told you all, don't just listen to my words. Check my words by what the word says. Check my words by scripture. Just because a guy is on TV, on TBN, does not mean he's always right. Just because a guy has a million, two million, how many ever followers on YouTube doesn't mean he's biblically accurate. In fact, it probably means he's not. Because people listen to what they want to hear. Check it. And let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Because Jesus said this in John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Our minds should be so saturated with Scripture that it makes the Holy Spirit's job easy. He's just got to say, oh, dip, right there, and it just comes to mind. We got to saturate our minds so that the Spirit can work through the Word in our minds and in our hearts. What does He say? He says, I'm going to bring it to your remembrance. That means you've got to have learned it at some point. You've got to have at least read it because... If you don't know something, you can't remember it later, right? If I ask you, do you remember where my, my uh, spare key to the house is hidden? Everybody's got one, right? I'm not going to tell you where it's at. But you're going to say, how would I know that? There's only three people in this room that probably know where that's at. Why? Because we put it there. You can't remember something you never knew. And you've got to learn the Word of God. You have to have read it for the Spirit to bring it to your remembrance. For the Spirit to do His part, you've got to do your part in this instance. We've seen Satan's deception play. He questions God's Word. He denies God's Word. He substitutes his own lie with something from God's Word. We've seen the effects what does it make us do? Add to, take away, or change. And now we've seen the defenses. We memorize God's word. We use God's words properly. We study God's word. Think about God's word. And rely on the Holy Spirit. In the NFL, since our whole series is gathered around football, on Saturdays, if they play Sunday, they don't practice. They practice, but they don't get in full pads typically and go out and just bang into each other. It's a good way to get an injury, right? You want your guys a little bit rested up. What they do is called a walkthrough. And so they'll go out, sometimes they're in shorts and t-shirts, and they're walking through the plays, and the coach is coaching them. And there's no contact, there's, there's no chance the, the defense or offense, you know, is going to outplay them that game because they're there alone with their coach. So here's how I want to close this message today. Let's do a walkthrough of this. How do we 
apply it. I want you to see what it looks like. And here's what it looks like. And, and, and when I say the enemy, keep in mind, Satan's probably not going to appear to you and tempt you. God is omnipresent. God can be with you at any time, any place. He's always with you. Satan's not omnipresent. Satan is one being. If he's with you, he's not with me. I doubt I'm that important that Satan's going to appear and tempt me personally. Right? He's going to spend his time on Kamala Harris or Donald Trump or... or Putin or, you know, Billy Graham's dead, but whoever the big mega preacher is these days, that's who he's going to be, you know, he, he's not coming to a rural church pastor probably. You say, so how does he do it then? How'd Kevin McAllister do it at home alone? I always love giving this illustration. Kevin couldn't take out two burglars on his own, could he? No, he's a little kid, he's nine. He can shop on his own, but he can't take out these birds. So what did he do? Laid all these traps. Remember? Tar on the steps, pulls his shoes right off. He must not have had them tied very, very tight, right? Pulls them, and then he steps on the nails. Ice on the step. Paint cans. Well, maybe that was the second one. I don't know. What's he do? He sets all these traps. That's what the enemy does. He sets traps. He sets lies from society. So when I say the enemy, know that it's not just Satan standing in front of you saying these things to you. It may be society. It may be something society teaches that's accepted, like evolution that's a lie from, the, from him. But when he says these things, here's how you do it. The enemy might say, how could God love you? You're way worse than anyone else. You say, no, Satan, God's word says this. No temptation has overtaken you except that it's common to man. I'm not worse than anybody else. And besides, Jesus can save me from any sin. No limitations. It says, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And you use scripture and throw it right back at him. God takes pleasure in seeing you suffer. That's why you're not being healed. No, the Word says God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places of Christ. God could never love someone like you. No, God chose me before the foundation of this world. You use Scripture against everything that He says. God doesn't want you. You're wrong, devil. He adopted me. He made me a joint heir with Christ. That's what the Word says. You'll never be good enough to get to heaven. No, I'm an adopted child of God. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise as a guarantee for my inheritance. God is mad at you. That's why He's not responding. That's why you can't hear Him. You say, now Lamentations 3.31 says, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though He does cause grief, He will have compassion according to the abundance of His steadfast love. For He does not afflict from His heart or grieve the children of men. You're too weak to do anything. No, God's power is made perfect in weakness. That's what the Word says, Satan, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You're not smart enough or, or worthy enough or pretty enough. No, Satan, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't have enough strength to go on. We sang it this morning. I love singing scripture. No, they who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You'll never be able to overcome whatever it is that you're battling, this addiction, the, the alcohol, the drugs, the pornography. No, Satan, I'm an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of His testimony. You'll never be as close to God as you want to be. No, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'm too strong for you to overcome. You can never beat me. Now, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. All those who rise up against me shall fall. 
You're too scared to ever make an impact in your life or in your world. Now, God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of sound mind. You take these words, you run them through the word of God, you throw them right back at him. You'll never experience peace. Now, the word says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. But God can't forgive you of that sin. That's too big. Now, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're too sick to be healed. No, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. You can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how it's done. We take those lies, we memorize the Word of God, we've studied the Word of God, we run it through the filter of the Word of God, and then we throw it back at the enemy. 